Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Lainey from the library team in HarperCollins, and I'm joined by Christopher Chris. Connolly here, also with the library team. We've got a great episode today. Yeah, we're very excited because we have two books that are very close to our hearts. We are joined by Jessica Anya Blau, author of Mary Jane. Hi, Jessica. Hey. And we're joined also by Will Leach, the author of How Lucky. Hello. And these are, hi, and they're two books that are both coming out on May 11th. So look at that, we didn't even plan that, both on May 11th. Um, so a very joyous day that will be because these two books just have such great characters that stick with you. And there's a lot of heart and the people who come to us after reading, they just can't stop talking about how much they love this book and spending time with them is just such a joy. So thank you for putting them out in the world. Yeah. Yeah. I think we, uh, we're seeing readers more and more nowadays looking for books that have weight, but still make them feel good, that, that take them along for a ride that they enjoy and that they cherish. And I assure you, dear viewers, you will cherish both of these books and you'll learn a lot more about them by discussing them with these two fantastic authors. Sorry for cutting you off, Lainey. <laughs> No, that was great. Um, so we're going to get into each book um, a little bit later, but uh, before we start, is there anything you guys want to say? Um, anything to librarians? Uh, I <laughs> I will say I am uh, I'm very delighted to do this. Uh, I am uh, uh, this is my uh, adult fiction debut, uh, so I'm very uh, forgive me. I'm very I'm a little bit uh, nervous and concerned that uh, you won't like me. So I'm going to do everything I can to uh, try to convince. I, I cannot tap dance, but you know what? I'm willing to give it a try or perhaps even perhaps a slight clog would be up for a clog if you're for that. But it's an honor to be here. I'm very delighted to come on. Well, and yeah, well, as someone who would ride her bike to the library after school many days, I love libraries and I've always loved librarians. So those it's sort of my favorite people. Librarians and libraries, and I and I love the smell of library books. It's like I would wear that in a spray if they sold it. <laughs> Me too. Yeah. Well, thank you both for being here, and I think we're going to put Jessica in the virtual green room. Enjoy the virtual cookies we put out for you, and we'll talk to you in a little bit. Thank you. All right. Talk to you then, Jessica. Okay. Well. Oh, it's um, just me now. Just you. You heard it here first. He's willing to do a club. So exactly. I don't actually know how to do one, but you know what? It can't be that hard. They're just loud. I've seen the Geico commercial. I don't know. I'm sure I have a clogger above me in my apartment <laughs> yeah, Exactly. Oh, wow. There you go. Goodness. Um, well, you spoke at our ALA diversity program that we had um, about writing different and diverse characters in fiction. And that was really, really wonderful. And I love that when we were setting this up, um, your publicist had put us together to talk about it and she said Lainey and Will back again and so we're very glad to have <laughs> you back um it was such a joy to talk to you before but we're super excited to let librarians ask you some questions um and so I'm going to do a little intro of you and then you can tell us about How Lucky so Will Leach author of How Lucky so Will is a contributing editor at New York Magazine and writes weekly for the magazine Intelligencer and Vulture and he also writes regularly for NBC News, New York Times, Washington Post, Medium, and MLB.com, and is the founder of the late sports website, Deadspin. And this is your fifth book, but like you said, your fiction debut out on May 11th. And um, please tell us more about How Lucky and these wonderful characters. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, How Lucky, uh, I live in Athens, Georgia, and uh, go dogs, though I'm actually an Illini, uh, so I'm very much enjoying my number one uh, founding Illini right now. But I'm, uh, I live in Athens, Georgia, and it takes place in Athens, Georgia, and it is about a man named Daniel. Uh, da Daniel uh, is 26 years old. He lives by himself. Uh, he actually answers phone. He ha actually is, has a job uh, doing social media for a regional airline. If you can imagine how pleasant that makes his day uh, to deal with angry, uh, angry fly uh, flyers missing their connections all day. Uh, but one of the things that, uh, uh, but you know, he actually has like a pretty regular, uh, normal life. Uh, he's he's very autonomous. Yeah, he's he feels kind of comfortable with where he is and very fortunate, uh, even though, as I kind of try to uh, unveil somewhat uh, um, stealthily at the beginning of the book, he actually has a disease called spinal muscular atrophy. Now, uh, 
uh, it's, it's a kind of a complicated disease to be able to explain uh, in, in a short concept, but the very shorthand, if you know nothing about the disease at all, is to think of it as almost like a little bit like ALS, but it's diagnosed from birth. And so it leads to, uh, until fairly recently, he's 26. Uh, th there's been a lot of breakthroughs for kids today who have it, but uh, uh, there's a drug called Spinraza that's made a big, uh, made a big uh, improvement for them. But uh, for someone that's 26, uh, you're actually starting to reach a little bit of your uh, potential life life expectancy with the type 2 SMA he has. So he, uh, uh, he so the SMA has left him uh, actually un incapable. Uh, he's unable to speak. He's actually only able to use his left hand. Uh, he can move certain parts of his body, but the but he has his chair is controlled by his left hand. And what happens is one morning, as he always does, he goes out to his porch to try to like kind of breathe in the day. And he sees a, uh, uh, well, a college student, because this is a college town in Athens. He sees a college student who is a uh, who he sees pretty regularly, but has never really talked to and doesn't even know if he, she's ever seen him. He sees her get in a car and go away and thinks it's unusual. And it turns out it was unusual and uh, ends up becoming a major thing that's going on. Uh, was she kidnapped? Did she get in the wrong car? Did she go missing? And a large part of it is him and his caregiver, a woman named Marjani, uh, and his best friend, a, friend, a, man named a man named Travis, who's from his hometown in Illinois. Uh, they try to figure out what's going on while uh, Daniel uh, kind of deals with kind of the, I wouldn't say the difficulties of, of his disease, but uh, certainly, uh, the, the hurdles uh, that uh, uh, trying to figure out what's going on and solve uh, this mystery while we still learn a lot about him and basically his outlook on life. And, you know, a couple of things that kind of inspired me to write this book. Uh, one, I think is probably the more obvious one, which is, uh, which is SMA itself. Uh, I am able uh, uh, myself. And uh, so I recognize that at a certain level, I cannot possibly understand uh, SMA better than anyone who has it, or even a lot of people that uh, live with those who have it. But uh, I certainly, uh, what inspired me to originally do the book is my son, I have, a, I have two sons, William nine and Wynn six. And William's uh, best friend, pretty much since birth, is, an, is a kid named Miller, who uh, was diagnosed uh, at the age, there they are, right in a Georgia, about to go to a Georgia football game. Um, they were uh, best friends, really kind of from birth, because they're, they're uh, my their mothers were best friends uh, growing up in Columbus, Georgia. And uh, they kind of discovered kind of early on in a scene that's replicated in the book that uh, William, my son, was able to kind of put weight on his legs and Miller wasn't. And it turned out that he had SMA. And so uh, we've been very involved in Miller, very involved with Miller and very involved, involved with SMA. And uh, there's a race every year called Go Miller Go that we always go to. They live in Charleston, South Carolina. We spent a lot of time down there and I really found myself um, not only fascinated, uh, uh, actually mainly fascinated with the way that people reacted uh, to people with SMA. SMA is not a neurological disease. It is a, it is a, the, the Miller is uh, uh, consistently destroys my son in Madden and will not stop mocking him for it. Uh, and so I kind of learned uh, a lot from him and I talked to a lot of people with SMA and I really, but the second reason, probably the more concrete reason I wanted to, to, to write the book was uh, I really kind of discovered Daniel. Uh, the, the book is told in a uh, in a, the first person uh, from Daniel's perspective, and it was surprising to me as I I, I grew to really deeply love him. And uh, and I think one of the key things to Daniel is you know, Daniel is independent of of his condition or his life or his job or anything else. He is a relentlessly positive person, and in the in the face of often uh, difficult uh, things, in, independent of of him, his SMA. And uh, I don't know about you all, but I actually feel like uh, things have been a little more difficult than I was perhaps expecting over the last year or however many years you might want to define that. It's been a difficult time. And so for me, uh, I, there was something about discovering Daniel's voice and discovering uh, how he uh, tackled the world uh, in a way that I did not was not expecting when I kind of put this together. So for me, uh, I think that I think that what Chris said is uh, is right. You know, this is a book that there is a mystery. There is I, I think there are thriller aspects to it, uh, but this is a really a story of Daniel and uh, and kind of uh, his attitude on the world and the way he kind of tackles the world uh, in a way that um, I think would hopefully benefit us all. Would probably be the best way. To Wow. Yeah. And I have to tell everybody like how funny it is. Like there's, 
hit Daniel's voice, like I would just crack up laughing out loud reading the book. And can you tell them about his job at the airline a little bit more? Yeah, yeah. Basically, his job is to respond uh, to respond until you don't respond uh, to angry travelers. And you know, they're in the South too. This is also the book takes place. Another aspect of the book is it takes place in Athens, Georgia, during a game day weekend. So if anyone knows anything about college football, again, I am from the Midwest. I moved to Athens, Georgia. I lived in New York City for 13 years, and I moved to Athens in 2013 and just got a quick SEC football education, specifically the tailgate situation and uh, the way people get obsessed about going to their games back when you could go to games. And so uh, a large part of his job is trying to assuage angry travelers who are just trying to get to like the Alabama game or the Tennessee game. And uh, one of the things that, that I think that that is that is really interesting about Dan, you'll know, is that he actually finds, you know, listen, I'm online, you all are online. It is not always the happiest, most friendly place to be. Um, but one of the things about Daniel is he actually truly kind of enjoys it. It's not like he parries or likes to fight or anything, but there's something, uh, you know, one of the things that he that Daniel talks about a lot in the book is how frustrating it can be to to like just be, you know, just a just a normal average person like everybody else and have everyone treat you differently instantly. And one of the things he actually discovers that he really likes working online is people just, they don't even like, they call him terrible names on regular basis. He's like, great, no one would ever do that <laughs> in real life. They'd be so like nice to me or like so awkward and so on. He actually finds that, uh, that kind of thing almost kind of, uh, uh, I wouldn't say invigorating, but certainly, uh, you know, it makes him, uh, uh, f he appreciates that in a way that for me as someone that I have been like, I started my career working online uh, and I know, uh, and, and I'm a white guy, like anyone, like they're not, people are easier to me online than they, they really for, for, for any other group. And it's still very mean and cruel on there. And I think we've all kind of got this idea of the internet is now, uh, it's not what it was when I started. When I started, it was this place of just discovery and finding all of these new people and all of these new things. And, and wow, like someone cares as much about this weird Hong Jong, <laughs> this this weird South Korean movie that I that I that I, that I didn't know anybody cared about, and it was this it was like wow the world is opening up to me in a way that had not been before. We don't really think of the internet that way uh, anymore, but I think we could again. And I tried to like I, I wanted to kind of capture that kind of idea of the good parts of what online life can be. And the online life is not a major part of the book, but it did kind of want to go into the idea of why, why he has this job, why he kind of likes this job. And, uh, and, you know, for him, it's, it's, it's what the internet was supposed to be in the first place, which was an expansion. You know, I feel like in a lot of ways it's closed off everyone and made everything flat. And I don't think that's what it was meant to be. And I think it's not the way that he handles it. Yeah, that's really interesting. And I think that also, you, I like that you said he's like relentlessly positive <laughs> and that kind of goes into him being kind of an unlikely person to kind of be an online sleuth to solve a crime, <laughs> but he's kind of the perfect person at the same time because he has this, uh, an, 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 I can't speak, he's anonymous as well mm -hmm. as not at the same time, like people maybe overlook him. Um, and he feels, talk, yeah, sorry, sorry. And, one way, and he actually feels like, I think it's interesting too, because it's not clear to him and really to a lot of people that something has actually happened. And I think that's actually kind of key to the point too, is, you know, this is not something that he feels like, like he, this is not, he doesn't have an obsession with thrillers or want to like get involved. In fact, he kind of consistently feels kind of uncomfortable and almost kind of guilty, almost invasive uh, in, in kind of get, right. getting a part of this, which I think is kind of an interesting aspect to it too. Yeah, yeah. And I wanna go back to the football because <laughs> we've talked about this, I'm from, Oxford, Mississippi, mm -hmm. and I, which I'm going to talk about in a second, but I think like you, you had touched on this, but I feel like this college town is kind of a character in its own. Like you get so well, this like vibrating city that comes to life from these football games. And even if you don't really know a lot about SEC football, which is in a league of its own, <laughs> as you said, um, it's just so, so you did such a good job capturing that. And um, I have to read you this quote about Oxford, Mississippi that you said, mm -hmm. which I found hilarious. So he was talking about all of the um, different, like Daniel's talking about all of the different places for SEC football, but he says, Oxford, Mississippi, that place looks like a party out of Get Out from Football Saturdays, mm -hmm. which I think perfectly encapsulates like not only the way, it's just so funny, but the way that football is its own character and comes to life, but also there is a lot of like, you did a good 
job showing that there's a lot of things behind it and also rivalries and like how mm -hmm. people feel like he feels that way about Oxford because he likes that team. And I don't know. I just, yeah. wanted to, and, and, it's funny too, and it's like, as Daniel himself, you know, Daniel is hardly some like hardcore football fan, right. but he lives in Athens, Georgia, <laughs> where football is, you know, it's kind of the centerpiece of, of so many things, but it's funny, you know, because one of the things I love about Athens, Georgia, and I think this is true of a lot of college towns, there are so many different characters characters in the town like you know i mean rem was it still lives here like i like I, I i keep running i actually ran into michael stipe while he was buying cat buying cat litter like not very very long ago like like uh, and you know so like it's it's still a small like the nice thing about college town is there's a there's a thriving music scene but there's also you know there's also still we're still in the south and like all that comes in with that you know is and to me one of the things as someone that this book is not about sports and i've written about sports for a, a lot of my career so it's almost i think it's it's surprising to people that sports is not really a driving influence of this book. But I do think that one thing that I think sports is good at and hopefully comes across in the book is it really can be, it isn't always, but it can be uh, uh, frankly, a thing where that brings in people from all different sorts of backgrounds and all different sorts of beliefs. And if they're rooting for your team, they're your best friend. If they're not, they're a horrible person. And I always joke about sports that like it becomes, it's a way to get out unhealthy emotions. Like you know, the, the joke I always say is that like, like I think about things that when I watch my line, I play tomorrow, uh, when they, when they score a basket, I'm going to like jump up and scream. And like, nothing does that from sports other, other than maybe like a spider. Like if I saw a spider, I might do that. But but otherwise, you know, and to me that that's something I think Daniel tries to get across in the book. It's not so much that that sports uh, that he doesn't he's not really a sports fan, but like that vibe of game day and the community and kind of everything that surrounds it that week uh, hopefully gets across what this town that's now become my you know my I've been here for almost eight years now and I'm a Midwestern and I lived in New York but uh, I encourage everyone to uh, uh, Athens when, when all this is over and we all have our vaccines uh, come to Athens Georgia it's a it's a wonderful place and you too can see Michael Stipe buying cat litter. I love that so much um I don't know if Chris, you have any questions with, I don't want to monopolize all the time, but. No, that's all right. A lot of love coming in in the comments. Um, before we kind of get into some of those, Will, you had a section you wanted to read from the book? Uh, yeah, sure. And it'll be brief. It is literally like the first 150 words of the book. <laughs> so so uh, this is, a, this is as, as much of a teaser as I can. For the record, this is the first time I've done this. It's also weird because I love Daniel so much. It feels weird to talk to him in my voice. <laughs> like, I feel like, like this is not me. Like, I'm not going to do him justice on this. So, for, so forgive me. But uh, nevertheless, this is the actual beginning uh, of the book. So this is how lucky uh, by, you know, I guess me, but really about Daniel. <clears throat> My life is not a thriller. My life is the opposite of a thriller. And what a relief. Who wants their life to be thrilling? Don't get me wrong. We want our life to be exciting. We want them to inspire, to be surprising, to provide us a reason to get up and experience something new every day. But thrilling? No way. Everything that happens in a thriller would be completely terrifying in real life. We've seen a million chase scenes in movies, so many that you barely even look up from folding laundry when one happens whenever, when, with whatever you're watching on Netflix at that moment. But you know, those scenes, they're dull, they're rote, they're boring. But if you were in one of those scenes, it would be a nightmare. You would be running for your life. If you survived it, you would spend years trying to get over it. You would shake and you would talk about it in therapy. You would have nightmares reliving it, which you woke up screaming. You'd have trouble developing any sort of human connection with another person because of this terrifying thing that had happened. It would be the worst thing that ever happened to you. Real life, mercifully, is not a thriller. These things don't happen to you and they don't happen to me. My life is nothing but small moments, and so is yours. We don't live in a series of plot points, and we should be thankful for that. We should realize how lucky we are. There we go. Uh, I'll, you want me to keep going to the end of the book? I wasn't sure how much time we had. <laughs> you okay. can't give away the store, Will, okay, so sorry. I'm sure people sorry. would love it. <laughs> bye, bye. Uh, <laughs> um, I just, I wanted to talk maybe a little bit about the secondary characters and what it was mm -hmm. like writing them. I mean, I think, and I don't want to mispronounce her name, Marjani. Marjani, yes. Who's an amazing character. Um, and and I'm just curious what it was like. Did you talk to people, to caretakers? Like, how do you go about writing these characters? Because they are just so good. 
Well, uh, so thank memorable. you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, Marjani, you know, my mother, uh, who's now retired, and uh, I'm actually at her home right now. So if she comes behind me right now, she'll she'll say hi. <laughs> She's very Zoom uh, amateur. But um, the uh, she was an ER nurse for 40 years. And so uh, I like to the head of the ER, like ER, I don't know if anyone knows, like there are all sorts of different kinds of nurses, but there's something specific I think about an ER nurse that um, there is a, the, the, the combination between uh, you have to uh, be the saving grace for someone and like at the most difficult, challenging part of their life where they're at their absolute worst um, and you have to help them and you have to care for them, but you also have to hold on to a part of yourself and because otherwise you would have this constant tragedy in your life every three times a day, every day for your entire career. And I've always found that, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a professional writer. So like, I've never, I, I think about like jobs, like, uh, like, like, like my mother's and like people that work in, in, like in healthcare and in, in that industry, there is, you, know, you are always seeing people who are not at their best. And the, the tie, the kind of soul you kind of have to be able to do that and, and sustain it, you know, I mean, like, uh, to me was very powerful. And for me, Marjani, you know, Marjani uh, uh, is, she she is she is she has actually has several jobs. I thought it was actually it was kind of interesting from what I talked about because she's not she is um, uh, Daniel's caretaker, but Daniel I think quite definitively does not want a full time care, care, caretaker. He is he definitely he does not feel he's very independent. He does not feel that he needs someone to be watching him all the time. Uh, and so Marjani is actually just his part time caretaker. She ends up spending a lot more time with him because she clearly loves him. <laughs> like she clearly just like deeply cares for him, which I think is also kind of interesting too and because she's she's this interesting mix of kind of like prickly and a little bit like difficult at times because she has to push him to in certain directions and be like that and and deal she has to be the bad cop in a lot of ways but she also is you know she is a caretaker and she is someone who 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 has allowed herself in a job that in many ways is designed to make this difficult for you to do to still care and uh, so I think that uh, I, I really, to me, just like, I, I, I interview a lot of people at SMA. I did not interview a lot of people from healthcare industry because I mean, honestly, that is, I've been, I, I uh, to this day, if I go back to Mattoon, Illinois and walk into Sarah Bush Lincoln Health Center, um, well, now that would, I'd be wearing a mask, but, <laughs> but they would immediately be like, oh my gosh, we saw you when you were three years old. And now like, you know, I kind of grew up in that kind of, uh, kind of a, a, a immediate healthcare world. So I've seen people scream at my mother uh, for not doing something that, that they just, they're at the worst, they're, they're in the ER. And so something about the profession has always, uh, it, it's always felt, uh, it's just, it, there's a selflessness but a self-protection, the way you combine those two things, uh, something I really want to kind of capture with Marjani. Um, and you've gotten so many great quotes coming in, Richard Russo. We were just talking before we started about uh, Kevin Wilson, which I think I have one yeah. that I think you sent that to share. Yes. Is that, oh, there's Richard Russo's yes. quote. Um, fictional character speaking to us in a voice we haven't heard before. I have no idea who sent him the book, by the way. That was amazing. <laughs> like Richard Russo is one of my favorite writers in the world. And Kevin Wilson, too. Like I, I literally have no idea how either one of them got the book. So, <laughs> so uh, like, I, I literally just, one day I, I woke up in the morning. I remember, you know, this is my first novel. Like, you know, I, if, if you want to, I, I read, like, I write for New York Magazine every week. I write for Medium. I write, if you love baseball, I write about baseball all the time. But, you know, this was a leap. You know, I, my, the, the thing with this book is I, um, I, I, the last book I'd written was 10 years ago and it was nonfiction about sports. It was actually about a, a book called Are We Winning, which was about the connection of like fatherhood and baseball and my relationship with my father. And, uh, and it'd been 10 years since I wrote one. And I met my, I met my agent for dinner in New York about uh, I'd say a year and a half ago now, and I had not even told him I was doing this. And I was like, hey, I made this, I gave this to you. And I felt, I thought it would be like a big dramatic moment, like a Wonder Boy sort of thing. But he's like, great, now I have to carry this around like <laughs> everywhere all night. I was like, don't worry, I, I saved it on a file. I'm not going to lose it in a cab. Um, but I wanted the dramatic notion of it. So, you know, for me, this is all to be entirely honest that, that, that anyone, uh, I had no idea if uh, this I had no idea if anyone would like this. I just I would like it, or if anyone would buy it, or anyone would care at all. I just I just it was just a, I really want I I kind of got Daniel's voice in my head, and I couldn't let go of it. And so I just kind of wrote it, and then I gave it to him, and he's like, 
he's like, I think we can do something with this. And so to, to see like Richard, like, again, I don't know how he got it. I don't know how Kevin Wilson, got it, how, how Chris Bojalian got it. Like, you know, so I know, I know the world of blurbs are our, our, our next guest. I'm sure she's much more experienced with this, but there's something about like, wait, like, the imp like empire falls like kills me like that's like one of the greatest books i've ever read and uh so i i'm still not entirely certain someone to just not just grab richard russo's email address and uh and then just send it to my editor and we're gonna we're gonna be him for a, a big surprise on pub day when he's like yeah that's that's no that's my, that's my brother robert <laughs> no they these books found their way into the right hands and they're they love it and i just quickly will answer ask some questions but we just got a starred book list review which congratulations and i think it's such a lovely quote that i'm gonna just read a little bit it says it's rare that a crime novel could be described as lovely but this is such a lovely book beautifully written and suspenseful at the same time being all about goodness and caring without at once being sappy or well, sentimental, and that is a rare feat in fiction. And I think that is just an amazing quote. And they did not get the booklist email, but booklist wrote that. So. <laughs> yeah. well, I'll take your word for it. <laughs> <laughs> so congrats. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Chris, do we want to ask some questions, maybe? Sure. We have a lot of comments and love and questions from our librarian viewers. Also, funny coincidence, a gentleman named Blake Leach says everyone likes Will Leach. So oh, that's okay. That, I, that, 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 is, that is definitely a, uh, a fake account. That is, I don't know, <laughs> never heard. Well, Leach is a unique name. That I <laughs> Hi, Blake. How's it going, man? Uh, let's see here. Um, so Todd Kruger, just a quick comment. Todd Kruger from Baltimore County Public Library says, I loved reading Shane Burkall's memoirs about his life mm -hmm. at SMA. Uh, so this novel sounds fascinating. Um, Shane's a then, wonderful writer, by the way. I, I encourage everyone. I know that like that he's kind of become like a like a personality a little bit, but like frankly, as a writer, he's actually a very lovely writer. I encourage everyone to read that book. Excellent. So you heard it here first from Will Leach. Do check that out. Uh, Carla Sudo says, "Did you have to do a lot of research outside of your personal experience with your family's friend?" Yeah, I actually did talk to several people, uh, bo both who had SMA and also lived with people who ha had SMA. And uh, I'm just, uh, to me, I'm just so grateful that they would allow me to, I mean, again, I'm like, I'm an, I'm a 40 year old guy uh, uh, and uh, who do, who's, who's able, who's able bodied. Like, you know, I'm the, I, the, obviously I have a lot of experience with Miller and obviously closest in our family, but I, I mean, there's just the, the amount of things that I cannot know uh, approaches the infinite. So, you know, for me to uh, uh, obviously like I, I needed, there, there's so many great uh, things there. One of one is like a concrete example is uh, one of the reasons that uh, uh, the things that one of the challenges in the book is that Daniel can't talk. He can he has he has like a speaking box, but he's un he's unable to speak, and uh, at least he, he and to, he but he used to be able to, and that comes from this idea that I discovered talking to a lot of people with SMA because it's a progressive disease. Like it actually is just always getting worse, and so there are things that if you don't do them often enough, you just stop being able to do them. Which to me is there's something. Like when I sat down to start writing about this, I have something I just did not know uh, about the disease. And to me, that, that makes it, there, there's something incredibly fascinating about the idea and sad about the notion that like you, like not only can you lose things, like you actually have to actively practice at like just basic things all the time or you'll lose them. You know, I had one uh, woman tell me that, that uh, you know, she, she used to have a, 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 as she was getting older, she would, she, uh, she'd always made sure no matter what, even if she had a caregiver there, she would always like make sure to brush every tooth herself and get to every spot, no matter what. And then she had one caregiver who insisted on doing it and she got tired of fighting him and then she stopped being able to do it. And there was something like really, really sad about that. Now, Daniel's situation, to be very clear, most people with SMA can speak. Like that is an unusual condition. Uh, Daniel, Daniel actually had like a broken jaw. That was the reason that he was unable to do it. But yeah, the number of like, uh, of things that I learned, I mean, it's like, I, I, I'm not entirely like, this is Daniel's story. Like, this is not a book about SMA. It is not the definitive. If you have SMA, this is what it's like. And I, hopefully it doesn't read that way because I, I, would, I don't, wouldn't have any business writing that book. Uh, but what I do think, but you do have to get the details right. You have to get the big stuff right. And uh, I, to me, I felt like I had to talk to as many people as possible. I'm sure there are like, it's, it's not meant to encapture the, the SMA experience, but uh, certainly uh, it's, it hopefully it captures Daniel's. 
I think the care to tell that story the right way is definitely shown in the book. Um, so Maureen Roberts, what were the challenges you faced writing a novel coming from a journalism background? Yeah, actually, I found at first, until you have to do revisions, it's like so much easier. So I'm like, wait, I can just make the people do what I want. This is amazing. Like ordinarily, you have to stick doggone it to actually what happened. It's very frustrating because you're like, no, I just want to like, like there's so many times when I'm right. I just wrote a, a long feature about for New York Magazine about more than a vote. Uh, LeBron James is a new political activism uh, organization for uh, athlete activism. And there's so many times when I told that story, I'm like, oh, man. I wish this detail were just about 35% juicier. Like it's good, but I just, I want to make it a little bit better. Oh, if only, if only I were not construct, constricted by truth and facts, how irritating. Well, the nice thing about this is I can make my little people do what I want them to. Now, as it turns out, as someone that is doing this for the first time, that it is absolutely not that simple. <laughs> and you have to fix like a million things uh, throughout, but certainly uh, uh, from to starting out, I found it, actually, to be honest, kind of liberating uh, uh, to, to, to kind of try that uh, a little bit. And I'm, I, I kind of, you know, I will confess, I kind of have the uh, the bug now. I'm actually already working on the next thing. And uh, um, hopefully, uh, uh, I, I, uh, it's, uh, it's I, I like it. I don't know if I, I still don't know if I'm any good at it, but I definitely like it because I can move all the people around and make them make them do what I want. Uh, well, I don't want to spoil anything, Will. You're, you're very good at it. I just want to tell you that right now. Um, so our friend Janet Lockhart says, and she read and loved this book, I really liked the relationship between Daniel and his mother. Was that there from the beginning or did it develop as you worked on it? Yeah, that's a key thing because his mother is not a major character in the book, but she's certainly a major presence in the book. And one of the key things about this, and this came out of a, a lot of conversations with people who lived with people in SMA, and particularly a lot of guilt, frankly, that a lot of people that had not just SMA, but, but uh, uh, Duchenne's, Duchenne's, Duchenne's syndrome or muscular dystrophy, some other, so uh, like, they almost felt like a certain amount of guilt that like not like because their parents or their caregivers or the people close to them cared so much about them and just wanted to take care of them, they they sometimes worried that, wait, did my disease take down, like, did it hurt them? And one of the things, what uh, Miller's mother, who I've, who I've become very close with, one of the things that she is em emphatic about is, listen, I, like, I'm there to help Miller, but like, Miller's got to figure this stuff out on his own. And, 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 and that's hard, frankly, for any parent to do. Like it is hard for me to do with my children, my, with my able-bodied children now to like, I want to like make it better and I want to fix it. And so one of the key things about their dynamic is because um, the, the thing of the thing about his mother is she is not only she does not live in Athens, she is actually always on, she's in the book. She's always, she's on vacation, like all week. There's like, like handsome strangers applying suntan lotion on, on Skype calls to her. And, uh, and obviously there's, there's more, there's a backstory to that. And, but one of the things that Daniel, it was very important to Daniel was once he was able to do so, he really wanted to live on his own. And he wanted to be able to, not only for himself, but in many ways for his mother to be able to like give her the life that he worried. And I don't think that's entirely accurate. I don't think his mother believes that, but I know that Daniel feels that way, that somehow he uh, uh, kept her from things or was unable, or she was unable to, to uh, live the full life that she wanted. And so Daniel like is very emphatic about like, I'm going to go here and I'm going to, I'm going to be as independent as possible. And, the, and so, and so she, so I, while she obviously deeply cares about him and, you know, she is also, she's living the life that Daniel wants her to live. And I think that that's, that's actually kind of a, a key thing. So thank you. I actually, I will say that is a, uh, um, because she's not in the book as much as uh, as Marjani and Travis, who we haven't even talked about yet. Um, I think that I, I really feel like the mother is an incredibly important character in the book. And uh, but because she doesn't make active appearance in the current storyline as much, I think she gets lost. So I'm, I'm actually very glad that you pointed that out because I think that's that's important. Well, we're running out of time, but before we go, is there anything you want to say about Travis? Just to <laughs> yeah. tell him a little bit about that relationship. Yeah, Travis. Travis is his is his best friend, really from from birth. As I said, they were they were they were both young together, and uh, uh, and Travis Travis actually moved to school to go to Athens to go to school, and Daniel kind of like follows him there. And Tra and but he is not Daniel's caregiver. Like he is he is uh, uh, an eccentric. Uh, he is uh, I think uh, I, I I think I he's compared to like Woody Harrelson and Foghorn Langhorn uh, in a certain sort of way. Uh, but and you know and he's he is uh, he is known to dabble. In 
in um, um, in uh, substances that are considered illicit in some states and not in others. Uh, and so, but he is, you know, there is a loyal, a rock rib loyalty to him. And the thing that Daniel, I think has always appreciated about him is that like, he's known him way too long to be like, Oh, do you need a hand? Can I help you push across the street? Like, he's just like, he's his friend. Like he doesn't like, he, like he is, he, the same way he gives them crap, the same way the friends have given them their crap forever. So to me, and and Travis kind of helps him along uh, with, uh, he gets kind of excited by the investigation a little bit as well, but also keeps causing problems because <laughs> it'll sort of happen a little bit with Travis. But um, uh, yeah, I think that th those are the, the main three characters, I think for the, uh, particularly for the first half of the book that kind of drive what's going on. So uh, Travis, uh, I will say I have, uh, I have had a few friends that are like Travis, I would love to have more <laughs> because Travis is a is a is a pretty uh, uh, that to me he's the platonic ideal of what you would want a friend to be. I love that. Yeah, that's it's really wonderful. Um, and Vicky Nesting said this might be just the book I need right now, and I agree. I think we were saying that before, just something uplifting, but also just sort of really great characters. So yeah. we, we we could use some some like. So good stuff in the world, man. Like in all honesty, like like that. Like I, for the record, when I started working on this, I did not know there was going to be a pandemic, and I did not know that 2020 was going to happen. The book takes place actually in 2019. During editing, we made very clear that like no pandemic, no references to anything involving pandemic, uh, other than the acknowledgments. Uh, but uh, but I do think that like that kind of idea of you know what people are. I'm sorry. This, this is a, this is a controversial say, thing to say on the internet. I actually think people are good <laughs> and I actually think they want to be good. And I, even when they make mistakes, I think people are good. And I tried to, uh, not everyone, obviously there's bad things that happen in the book, but um, uh, I, I think people are good. And I think, and I know that Daniel thinks that people are good and uh, hopefully that comes across. Well, on that amazing note, that was wonderful way to end that. And I agree, even if it is controversial, <laughs> that we're here for good people in the world um, and great books in the world. And this one is one of them. So thank you. And thank you for talking to us. You should, you have to go back and look at all the love and, and there's a few more questions. So maybe we can answer offline, but um, everybody's really excited if they haven't read the book already to read it. Well, it's an honor. Thank you for having me and uh, continued, continued great luck. And listen, we're, we're, it's going to be a great summer. I'm, a, I, I'm, a, I'm so excited for the summer. People are getting vaccinated. Everything's going good. It's a happy world. Go have a good time. Thanks, everyone. Yeah. Well, that's Thanks, all Will. Yeah. All right. So we're going to put you in the green room. And uh, if, if you don't mind, we'll come mm -hmm. back at the end to mm -hmm. say sayonara. But um, again, thank you. Well, this has been fantastic. And we'll see you in a little bit, okay? Bye. <laughs> All right, and now we're going to go ahead and bring Jessica Anya Blau on. Woo! He's this so wonderful. A great, yeah, this, this is a great, great hour. Lineup. Okay, and another book that people are loving. So let's go ahead and bring Jessica on. Hi. Hey, hey, Jessica, how are you doing? Hi, good. Okay, it wasn't too lonely in the green room, I hope. It was all right. No, I mean, I tried to get on to watch Will, but of course I couldn't figure it out. I had every device out and I never made it. I tried, <laughs> no I tried. Worries. It'll yeah. be available for replay, so not to worry. Good. So I'm just going to do a quick uh, introduction for you, Jessica, before we dive into the book. So there is the beautiful jacket, perfect. Uh, you're the author of the nationally best-selling The Summer of Naked Swim Parties and three other critically acclaimed novels, most recently The Trouble with Lexi. Uh, your novels have been recommended and featured on CNN, NPR, The Today Show, and in Vanity Fair, Cosmo, Oprah's Summer Reads, and many other national magazines and newspapers. And as we hinted uh, at the top of the episode, you're also a longtime library supporter. You've worked with us, the library team, extensively for past publications. And we're so excited to have you on. Um, I should also note, Mary Jane is our lead read pick for summer 2021. Uh, for those of you watching, I think you librarians likely know, but for anyone who's unfamiliar, that's a program where the sales staff votes on one title each season that we really wanna push in a special way that we think could uh, has a chance for both critical and commercial success. And Mary Jane won over the sales staff and it's our pick. So congrats on that. And thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Um, so just to start things off, uh, would you mind telling viewers 
I'm sorry, there's a motorcyclist outside. Uh, could you tell viewers about Mary Jane, what they're in for with this special novel? So Mary Jane, well, it takes place in 1975 and I love the 70s. Um, so that was fun to work on. And uh, it's about a 14, I'm on a screen porch at a friend's house. So there's a car driving by here too. Um, it's about a 14 year old girl who becomes a summer nanny for a psychiatrist and his wife. And she's in charge of a five-year-old girl. And unbeknownst to her, when she starts the job, a incredibly famous rock star and his famous movie star wife have moved into the house secretly and are living on the third floor so that he can be treated for addiction over the summer. And so it's her coming of age in a way, and it's everybody's coming of age. Everybody, hopefully, everybody changes by the end. The rock star, the movie star, the parents, the kid, and Mary Jane. Yeah, and I love this family. They're so unexpected. And Izzy, the child that Mary Jane is tasked with looking after, is so well written. So you said you love the 70s. Was that like an automatic choice for you when you were approaching this story? Like what kind of drew you towards that? I mean, it sort of was. I mean, because it was a time when you could hide a rock star and a movie star in your attic. <laughs> attic. <laughs> for a summer and uh you know and it's and it's before cell phones and the internet i mean it's a fun you can really get into sort of human emotions and you can get into discovery in a smaller more intimate way i mean now i mean a kid you know i don't know what age they are but they get on the internet age nine and they find pornography i mean it was like everything happened later and took longer and was a slower burn you know things simmered before they evolved so it seemed like a better, more in, to write about, you know, a good time. And then I love, I love the music from the seventies. And so when I write, I listen to the music of that time. So the entire time I was writing the book, I would, you know, I would either shout at Alexa to put on billboard top 100 songs from 1975, or I would go on Spotify and just do some 75. I would try and stick to the year prior because I didn't want to think about any song that came after the book. So I could do all of the 70s or the 60s. I mean, I just love, I love everything. The time period is interesting to me. Um, I'm not at my house. I'm, I'm at a friend's house. She's out of town and I'm at a house in the on the Eastern shore. And of course, when you go in somebody's house, you look around and you look at everything, even though I've been here before. So, you know, I poked through all the books and there are a lot of interesting and, and great books. And then I was poking around and I was, and I thought, oh my God, she has records and a record player. And it's like just touching and, you know, and there was like so many, just touching records was so fun and record covers. And then as I was poking, I was trying to find something. Sorry, there's a truck going by now. I'm on the porch because it has the best internet. Then I was trying to find something to read from the book, which of course caused me great anxiety. It was like, what can I read? What can I read? And I was looking for something to mark pages when I was choosing and I found polaroids which are you know the most amazing things <laughs> sorry these are all these devices i brought out to try and watch will and now they're in so i found polaroids and i thought oh my god i love polaroids like i love the look of them and the feel of them and so anyway the the time period is about when i wrote the book And, and I'm sorry, I broke up there a little bit, so I, uh, I'm sorry if I missed anything. Uh, Lainey, so do you have any questions about the book? I have so many, I don't want to hog them, so. No, this is just such a, uh, it, when we read it um, as a sales team, like everyone was coming in. I know I told Virginia, who can't be here today, but she loves it so much. I was like, I have to read this book. I have to talk to somebody about it. Um, and I love the relationship between Izzy and Mary Jane, and they both kind of don't, relate to everyone in their respective age groups, 14 and five. So they kind of find this connection. Um, and just, Izzy's just so funny. She's like just a spitfire. And she's growing up in this house with this, this doctor and his wife. And now these two people are moving in. Um, but I wondered if you could tell, I also enjoyed the relationship between Mary Jane and her mother. I think it's you know a fraught relationship in many ways, but she is having to hide that she's working at this house. So I don't know if you could talk a little bit about that and what her mother would not approve of at this house. Yeah, I mean, the house I put them in, the house I put Mary Jane in 
was more like the house of my friends growing up. So I grew up in a house sort of like the cones, you know, the refrigerator was full of unidentifiable food things that you would open up and dare yourself to Grew up in houses that were more like Mary Jane's house where everything was organized and controlled and you knew what there was for dinner and you would open the refrigerator and every food was identifiable. You knew what you were going to eat and you knew what it would smell like. And it was just so nice. So there was always, when I was growing up, there was that sort of conflict between what you have and what you want or what you have and what other people have and how other people's houses always sort of seemed more exotic and fun and I mean, other people's houses to me as a kid just seemed wonderful and peaceful and great. But my friends loved being at my house because it was like there was music playing all the time and there was records and there was strange foods and, you know, and it was this sort of chaos. So in creating these two households, Mary Jane's house and the Cones house, I was I was creating, you know, the two worlds that I went between as a child you know, and, and the difference in exploring one. And for Mary Jane in the book, when she enters the Cohen house, it's the first house like that she's ever been in. And her mother thinks of doctors as respectable people, but she would never think of a psychiatrist as respectable because she wouldn't think of therapy as something that a decent person would show up for. So Mary Jane sort of has to hide that he's a psychiatrist and not a medical doctor. And she's allowed to take the job because he's a doctor. And of course, she can't let her mother know there's a rock star and a movie star in the house or the sort of chaos of the house, which Mary Jane, I mean, she brings order to the chaos, but also the chaos opens her up to other ways of seeing the world and experiencing the world. Yeah. Yeah. And I do think that's another great thing about the 70s is you have like this kind of, you know, the more old fashioned, you know, nuclear family situation that you're talking about which Mary Jane comes from and then to like see that clash with a completely different way of life uh, in, in this family is so good and so fascinating um, yeah. and our friend Kimberly McGee says it was so interesting to see how Mary Jane became the only adult in the room and yet she simultaneously kind of gained the freedom of a childhood she never had it was like a very interesting mix of responsibility and childhood coming to the forefront yeah um yeah. really really good um uh, and again everyone loves Izzy <laughs> like is Izzy based on anyone in particular I mean is that how do well, you is, I know people always ask you know who, who am yeah, I in this book like, yeah can yeah. you talk about well, these characters I, I mean I do have two daughters and I have a hysterically funny niece and so she's a little bit of a mix of of all of them, but she's my one daughter, Maddie. She's a little more like that because Maddie would just, she was so comfortable with grown ups. Like she was always happy to be in a room of grown ups and to talk and participate. And, you know, she she wanted to, it wasn't that she thought of herself as one of the grown ups, but she just was so present with the grown ups. And my niece is like that. My other daughter, Ella, was, you know, a feral monkey climbing the walls and escaping to the roof, but, you know. So it's a little like my daughter, Maddie, and my niece, Sonia. <laughs> I love that. And actually, um, our friend Jennifer Winbury, she couldn't make it here, but she wrote to me specifically because she loves this book so much and she wanted to ask you a question. And she actually was telling us that Pippin was one of her first musicals. And so in the book, you know, she's a part of the, the show Tunes of the Month Club. And so she really related to that. Um, but she wanted to know... Uh, did you face any challenges setting the novel in the 70s, especially to situations or lifestyles that maybe are more acceptable or different as we perceive? And did you run into any certain situations that you maybe had to re rework because it was set in the 70s? Well, I tried to stay true to the time period and I tried to take, stay true to the place. I mean, there are, uh, there are things about the 70s and the time and the place that are just, you know, I'm so sorry. I got to get rid of this iPad that I was trying to get Will on. Um, so I was trying to, you know, be true to, you know, there were injustices and there were things that, you know, still exist today and are totally unacceptable and were unacceptable then. So uh, in being true to the place, I didn't, you know, I tried 
you know, there they are. And Mary Jane, you know, you, you know, you live in a, in a certain world and you live and you see things a certain way. And sometimes you can't see where you are until you step outside of it. And so in stepping outside of her, her world and her life, you know, in her private school and the country club and the neighborhood they live in going into the Cones house, Mary Jane stepped outside and could see some of the injustices and some of the things about the time and the place where they live, but she was only able to see it once she came outside of it and could see it with new eyes. So it, there was, um, yeah, I mean, of, of, of course you can't look at any time period and not see what's going on. Um, but the, the book is very small in its focus and that it's really Mary Jane and this family and, and these people and how they interact. And the world around them does come into play, but it's it's the, you know, cinematically it's it's this one, you're, you're in the house with them. Yeah, and seeing this journey through Mary Jane's eyes is just so absorbing and exhilarating and you know she's opening up she's discovering herself it is a it is a journey of self-discovery um yeah i just i absolutely loved it and i we have a lot of comments and questions from our librarian friends before we do that though did you have a section of the book you wanted to read because mary jane's voice is so good so it's so hard to pick i mean i was thinking i you know you don't know what would work okay so i was <laughs> either cleaning out the fridge i was thinking of reading when um Mary Jane finds out that there's going to be the patient and his wife in the in the house. And Mary Jane, I know, so this is, they're at, they're at what's called, there was a place in Baltimore, the place, book takes place in Baltimore, I don't know if we said that. But there's a place, there was a place in Baltimore called Little Tavern Burgers where they sold like, you know, it was as you bought them by the bag full. I think that was their slogan, buy them by the bag full. And there were burgers that were that big, you know, so you could pop a whole one in your mouth. And Mary Jane and her family would never go to Little Tavern Burgers, but she's lucky enough to go with Dr. Cohn and Izzy, her five-year-old charge. And Mrs. Cohn isn't there. And so they're in the, they're in, they're sitting in the front seat of the station wagon, the wood paneled station wagon with the bench seat. So they can all three fit side by side eating burgers. And Dr. Cohn says, uh, he just told her that the patient and his wife are moving into the house for the summer. Uh, can I trust you, Mary Jane? Dr. Cohn asked. I nodded again. Doctor-patient conf confidentiality is very serious in psychiatry. No one can know who I'm treating or why or even where. I understand. I was no longer hungry, but I was nervous. So I reached into the bag and removed another burger. If Dr. Cohn was treating someone, didn't that mean that someone was crazy? So would a crazy man and his wife be in the house where I was working all summer? And did I have to turn my face away and not look at the man to preserve doctor-patient confidentiality? The whole thing felt big and scary. And as much as I enjoyed Izzy Cohn, the barefoot and sideburn nature of Dr. Cohn and Mrs. Cohn and the cluttered kaleidoscope of the Cohn home, I wondered if maybe this wasn't the job for me. So this patient, Dr. Cohn said, well, he's an addict. Even the press knows by now, which is why I'm telling you. Dr. Cohn tossed the other half of his burger into his mouth and took a big swill of his orange soda. I wondered why the press would know this man was an addict. Did the Baltimore Sun print lists of local addicts? I swallowed hard and said, will it be safe for me and Izzy to be in the house if an addict is there? Dr. Cohn burst out laughing, releasing a small spray of food. It's entirely safe. He would never harm anyone. No one chooses to be an addict, and my job is to help out those who are unfortunate enough to be struck with it. I treat drug addicts, alcoholics, sex addicts, the whole shebang. My face burned. I shoved two fries into my mouth. Izzy didn't seem to notice that Dr. Cohn had used the word sex with the word addict. I didn't even know you could be a sex addict. A slideshow started in my brain, images of people kissing, naked, pushing themselves against each other hour after hour. Would the sex addicts ever get hungry? Would they eat while doing sex things? So that's that's just when she finds out that they're coming to the house. And then of course, everything changes once she meets them. Oh, that's so funny. And, and this book is funny. I mean, it's so heartfelt, but really funny. And I think Mary Jane's internal conversation slash conflict that she is worried she's a sex addict yes. is also hilarious. Very, very good. Um, 
Let's see here. And we do have some time for librarian questions. Um, just a quick note, Vicki Nesting says, please tell me this is not being marketed as historical fiction. This is my time period. So I, <laughs> it's not, <laughs> I think so. Goodreads uh, put it on a historical fiction list, which I thought was, <laughs> well, cause I think of historical fiction writers as really super smart people and I'm not among them. Like I can write a novel, but I'm thinking historical fiction, you gotta be way smarter than I am. You wrote a novel, novels. I think I think you passed the, the genius test. Um, Rose uh, Marson, Rose. I hope I got your name right. Apologies if I didn't. Um, did you base the rock star on anyone and his wife? Did you have anyone in mind for that? Uh, I mean, I of course was thinking of people, and I had just read that great Keith Richards. Uh, I mean, I guess it's an autobiography, but I, I know he had a ghostwriter. But I had just read that, and he was. You know, I, I just love him in it. You know, I fell in love with him, but I didn't, but Jimmy is not Keith Richards, but it was nice to kind of go into this head of this guy who just wanted to play. I mean, he just wanted to play guitar and he really wasn't looking for fame. So it was sort of, I, I took this sort of internal life and created my own person. So it really isn't, but I did read that book right beforehand. And the, and the movie star, you know, I mean, I was thinking of lots of people. <laughs> Uh, uh, Kim McGee said the coloring books I laughed so hard and we won't give that away we'll let somebody go <laughs> but the coloring book was really funny um and then let's see Valerie Stoge I hope I'm saying it quick do you how did you choose the characters names well Mary Jane I, first of all I love the name Mary Jane and of course there's the play on Mary Jane being marijuana I mean my my Twitter feed is hilarious because I have my book titles in there you know, just to, you just kind of want to see if anyone's talking about your stuff. And so my first book, Summer of Naked Swim Parties, it's just, I almost don't look, I have to put my hand up. It's just porn comes in. I just like, I kind of look at it to make, you know, and then drinking closer to home, you know, I get a lot of stuff about, you know, people being pulled over for alcoholic drive, you know, driving under the influence and trouble with Lexi. There's always notes to some girl, hey, Lexi, can you, you know, and Mary Jane, my Mary Jane column, I mean, Listen, if there's anything you want to know about the cannabis industry, I've, I've got it in my Twitter feed because it's all showing up. So, I mean, I picked the name partly because it's such a great name and it's such a perfect 70s name. And I did kind of like the play because she does, she doesn't smoke marijuana, but she is introduced to it in the book and, and sees a lot of it. Um, Izzy, I wanted something exotic that wouldn't really be around back then. Every, you know, everybody was like Pam and Sue and Kathy and Karen. And so I wanted something to show the family outside of there. Uh, Dr. Cohn, I don't even does he, do I give him a first name? I, oh, Richard, yeah. <laughs> I am thinking, what is his first name? Uh, I don't know. I was just thinking of names at the time. Mrs. Cohn, Bonnie, I named her Bonnie after my mother because she's actually a lot like my mother and Dr. Cohn's a lot like my dad. So, and I, Mr. And, and Mrs. Dillard, Mary Jane's parents, I can't remember what I, what I named them. It's so funny, you write a book and then all this time goes by and I don't, there's gotta be better readers than that, yeah. Or like Sheba, that's the movie star's name. Sheba, I was thinking, what is just sounds kind of sexy and sultry. And I mean, that name I did play, you know, I write things down. I did play with that. I want sultry, sexy, alluring, one name. So it has to be pretty short. Um, so I was thinking of, you know, one named people and, and how, how just how powerful you are when you actually can go by a single name. I mean, that's incredible power. And I wanted to, her to have just be this really nice person with an unbelievable amount of power, which she does have. And so that, you know, that's those single name people have, have a lot of power, but Sheba, I wanted to be sexy and feminine and, and seventies. Sheba was a great name choice. I wish I was named Sheba, frankly. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I'm going to sleep on it. Um, so, you know, again, this is a 70 set book. Casey Davis, said you mentioned music for creativity did you watch any 70s movies or read any magazines like tiger beat or life to get inspiration kind of get into the times period i i mean i would read stuff online and the music i would wormhole i mean i would hear something i'd go on a playlist and then i'd hear a song i never heard before you know like get it up by parliament and it was like 
this is unreal. You know, it would be so great. I would be so excited that I would start wormholing and then I might read about a band or singers. So it was, a, there would be wormholing that I always thought, oh, I'm just avoiding writing or I'm avoiding my work, but who knows how it, how it filters in. But I did, the music was always playing and I'd get in the, I'd preset uh, the stations in my car. So for every book I have, you can tell I, the stations would be preset. So I definitely had seventies on preset, you know, and I would just hit it every time. And uh, so again, this is set in Baltimore, and I'm sorry if you mentioned this already, but Maureen Roberts uh, asked, why did you choose to set it in Baltimore specifically? Well, I, I love, I mean, I lived in that neighborhood. So I lived in that town, uh, in that in that little area. But Baltimore, I mean, I wanted, it had to be someplace that was close enough to New York for their sort of accessible to a rock star and a movie star. And then there had to be a psychiatrist, there had to be like a hospital that was prestigious enough that anybody who could see anyone they wanted would go there. So I was thinking of Johns Hopkins in Baltimore. But then it also had to have the small town feel, which Baltimore does. I mean, I know it's a city and I don't know if people have been there or not, but it's a city that feels like you're in a village. It feels like a small town, you know, and you bump into people. Um, there's also a little bit of an, of a, you know, I, I love Ann Tyler and I love all her books. And many of them are set in Baltimore, but not only set in Baltimore, but set in that neighborhood. So, and the store that they go to, Eddie's, is the store where I went to when I lived in Baltimore, but it's also the store where some of Ann Tyler's characters go to. So there's a bit of a, you know, an ode to all her books, you know, and, and the street, the street that Mary Jane lives on, if you, is the street in The Accidental Tourist. In the book, I don't think they mentioned the name of the street. I can't remember, but in the movie, they shot they shot it on that street. So there's there's a it was just for me and my heart and my love for, you know, the accidental tourist and dinner at the homesick restaurant and latter over years and all these Baltimore books that she wrote that I was, you know, were sort of playing into my my heart more than my head. Love that. And you have a Spotify playlist that we can share with everybody. So did, can, yeah, go yeah. on and, and play. Yeah. Wow. And so did you put that together before, like while you're writing the book or did you kind of go back and see ones that maybe inspired you during? I mean, while I was writing the book, I had a playlist of maybe 200 songs. Wow. <laughs> and then a friend of mine said, you have to winnow this down so that anybody will want to listen to it. Nobody's going to want to listen to 200 songs because I also had show tunes on there. I don't think, I think I maybe have one from Jesus Christ Superstar now because I also do love show, show tunes. So, um, you know, so I had sort of everything. So I did, I tried to just make it something that somebody would listen to beginning to end. So, which is hard when there's so, so much great music in the world in general. Yeah. Definitely. And I, I'm glad you do have a, a show tune in there because that's such a big part of Mary Jane's life because that's what her mother will let her listen to. So that's where she's coming from and her and Shiva kind of connect with that. I, and I think there was a lot of power in making Shiva, so, like you were saying, so kind. You know, I think it could have been easy for them to maybe make, not make fun, but kind of make fun that Mary Jane was so um, innocent and didn't really know that. But I think it's right. like a radical kindness. And I thought that was really beautiful too. Yeah. And straight. And Mary Jane goes to church and she sings in the church choir. And, you know, I think, I mean, it's not, you know, when she walked into a house like the Cones, she maybe she would feel that she should be embarrassed that she goes to church and sings in the church choir. But instead, Sheba and Jimmy, they used to sing in their church choirs. And they think it's wonderful that she sings in the church choir. And there's this sort of, you know, there's this kind of hippie, marijuana rock and roll thing happening in the house but it's not exclusive of loving choir music or you know enjoying singing in a church choir yeah. um and i wish i could read every single outpouring of love in the comments section of this but i do just want to read this one from kelly curry who said the characters in this book are some of the best i've ever read oh there you so go Thank so, you. and so she's nice. not alone in the love, I assure you. So, if you have time, I, I do recommend it'll be it'll be a nice ego boost because I mean this is a special book with so many people who adore it, Aww. and many of them are watching now. So, That's congratulations so nice. on! I need uh, an ego boost. I'm the most insecure, terrified person in the world. <laughs> well, Maureen Roberts said hello from 
down a mile down the road from Eddie's. <laughs> so she oh, yeah. I mean, it's, uh, that's a, it's a neat area. Baltimore is really a great city and it's a fun place to put a book. <laughs> Excellent. Well, um, I think that we got to all the questions, librarians who are watching, if for whatever reason we missed it, I'll, um, would you mind if we, we reached out, Jessica, later with any written questions that maybe we sure. didn't? No, didn't yes, on? I'm happy to answer. I mean, truly, I mean, I would ride my bike to the library after school and just sit there and hang out. My best friend, Debbie Kilb, and I, like, you know, it's like, go, go in the lemon orchard and run around or go to the library. That was our hangout spot. And I just think librarians are like the nicest people, the most helpful people. And mm. yes, I'll do anything for the librarians. So I appreciate it. And yeah, the, the love is mutual. So again, thank you, Jessica. Um, I guess we'll bring Will on for our final farewells. And uh, before we go on our merry ways, so let's bring Will back on. Welcome back, Will. Hi, Will. Hey, sorry. I just realized I got shorter. <laughs> <laughs> that was great. I cannot wait to read Mary Jane, by the way. Aww. I, absolutely I can't wait to read it. yours. I did, you know, well, I, I tried to sign up and download it last night and it was chaos. <laughs> yeah. We'll get you well, both books. We'll, we'll get yeah. both books to you. Yeah. And they're great companion reads. I, I, I do just think obviously they're very different stories but just they're the books we need the energy the wonderful characters the love that are in the pages they're unforgettable um and we're so excited to see these come to publication because they're going to be big they're already big so um anything else we want to say before we sign off jessica will i just thank you to I, anyone i, I want to be on this go ahead will <laughs> No, I mean, I, 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 this is the first time I've really gotten to sit down and actually like do one of these talking specifically extended things about this book. I, 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 I it's really fun. I think I might almost made myself think I like this book. I, I like <laughs> talked myself into it. So, uh, so thank you for letting me do this. I, uh, I had a blast. Excellent. Um, well, again, thank you all for joining us today, viewers. I, I'm sure along with us, you've enjoyed this greatly. The books are available to download and read for librarians on Edelweiss and NetGalley, and they both go on sale in May. So run, don't walk. Uh, they'll brighten your day, your week, your month. They're unforgettable. Thank so much. thank you both for joining us today. And uh, Lainey, do we have any announcements we need to get to before we sign off? Well, just one quick one tomorrow we are hosting our instagram takeover um and we will have sophie williams author of anti-racist ally she's going to be stopping by so go to harper library our instagram account and see posts from her all day tomorrow on friday it'll be super fun excellent all right well again thank you everyone for joining us today we'll see you next week and um again read these special books and uh, let us know what you think. Bye everyone. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye everybody. Ah. <laughs>